whole version of Susie. But I feel like I already know her and I like, oh, I love what she was putting out there. So let's bring her along live for my hate to got something to say, people. And here she is, my friend, Susie. Hi, Susie. How are you? Hi, Sandy. So good to see you. Hi, everyone. Okay, Susie, we're going to get right into it because we got a lot to cover. I got a lot of questions. But before we do that, I'm going to just read a little bit about you. And this is just a teeny bit. Dr. Susie Siegel is an attorney, educator, and the Walsh College's, I like this, chief champion, currently serving as their ninth president and CEO. Now, Susie, and there's much more, and I'm going to tell about it later, but I got to get into this one statement when I said, what do you want to tell women around the world? And I'll let you go forth because it's a good one, man. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, no, thank you. You were talking about what we were talking a little bit about before with, you know, how does the mind and locus of control work, that part of it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So one of the things that Sandy and I really wanted to make sure we shared with everybody is just, you know, one of the things we're going to focus on here is really locus of control and the subconscious mind. And I said, Sandy, the best way that I can really describe this and the best way to think about it, and I love these little props, are a compass and a magnet. And the reason why I wanted to tell everybody that is as we're working through the material in this live, I want you to think about the goals that you have as being the compass and then the results you see in life mm -hmm. as being the magnet. So Sandy, I'll let you kind of continue on with that, but I just wanted to put that out there for the audience so that they know when we talk about this, we want to be really mindful of why leadership, why control, why the mind is actually the most powerful thing we have and how to use it to get the results that we want. So I'm so glad you did that because I have to admit, I was getting ready to tee up your one saying that you had to the women in the world, but then we were like, okay, by the way, I love life. And then we we're talking about, no, I want to talk about the subconscious mind and it's all related. You know, I was yeah. just teaching kids today about their, they want to set goals and they still like, why are you working so much on where's your mind when you're setting the goals? Yeah. And, it's, it's everything. You're well, and to the point that you were making is 95%, the, probably the one line that I could sum it up in. This is what happens when you ask a lawyer a question. We go off, right? No, is 95% of really what's going on in our lives and our brain is really driven by our subconscious mind. And that's what I love to talk about. So we can actually take control of that to get a better life. So that's the one thing I would say, especially for women, is we don't even realize how much control we have. We just have to learn how to work with the operating mechanism. Okay, which is tricky, but I want I want to go into this first. This one line that you said: the most important quality we can bring into any room and any conversation is our energy. Yes, specifically our leadership energy, and we have full control over that. All right. So before we go into that subconscious stuff, why'd you pick that one? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, actually, I'm glad we did. This is why I love live because I wasn't sure what you were referring to, but now I recognize that you were talking about energy. Well, a couple of reasons. One is on a subconscious level, our energy literally leaks out through our words, our facial expressions, the way we walk, the gestures we use. And the brain is designed mm. to pick up on that. So when you are watching your energy, the single most important thing a leader can bring into the room is their energy. If it's positive, it's productive. And if it's focused on what's best in the room for other people. And so when their energy is off, right, when that magnet mind is off, we see the results we don't want to see. So knowing about our leadership energy, that's the most important thing any leader can bring in the room, especially mm. for women because we're so energetically sensitive by and large. So when we understand what drives our energy, we can get better results. I'm so glad you said that. Have you ever been in a meeting with men and women and the woman next to you will say, oh my God, you know, Billy seemed so off today. Did you sense his energy? Yes. And the guy says, what are you talking about? What, what, what do you mean? It was just, it was another day and you're thinking oh my god no way something is definitely bothering him is yes. that true i'm not saying all men and women yeah. are like that but i do think more women are in tune like 
So a couple of quick thoughts on that. Yeah. And I'm saying by and large. So I want to be careful because I want to respect different gender identities and orientations. Yeah. And, you know, not all these yep. things fit into neat categories. But here's one thing we can think about from evolution, right? In evolution, women had to learn how to read expressions from people very quickly because mm. we kind of grew up in, you know, we, we evolved in tribes and groups, right? And we had to know who we could rely on, who we could trust, you know, and the men were out there hunting and bringing food back. So, you know, how many times will we be in a room and all of a sudden someone's given someone side eye and the men are like, oh, I didn't even notice, right? Yeah. We're yeah. really trained for that in our DNA. Our, our evolution is really trained to pick up on that. And we're trained even when we're young, right? So understanding that gives us a greater command over it. That's why I think women in leadership, so powerful, because this is such a tool we can use. It's an asset. I agree. And can, can you tell, do you ever have somebody come in the room and they're like, hi, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And they're upbeat, but you're like, no, it's not real. You can yes. tell. Right? Yeah, when you it's can tell. There's, well, do you, in a couple of subconscious things, gosh, there's so much here we could cover. I always think if we can cover this much, we're probably going to get to this and that's okay. But you can tell by a couple, I'll just say a couple of things. And a lot of the audience, you may have heard this before. So this may not be new, but the eyebrows, the eyebrow raise, right? Nobody likes to do that because the Kardashians are always like, oh, it's going to cause wrinkles. But when I come into the room and I smile like this versus, right, we're happy to see oh. each other. And and think about with babies, when you, when you see a baby, you're like, huh? the baby's like, oh, they like me, their eyebrows. So the eyebrow raise is sort of a universal, friendly, welcoming. It's almost like a hug. Yeah. The other thing is the extent to which you smile with your eyes. Like, do your eyes actually squint a little bit and smile? Or are you like this? Oh, nice to see you, right? So subconsciously, we are trained, again, yeah. the magnet mind to pick up on these little subtle clues. So absolutely. And Sandy, what you're referring to, not only does that happen, but it's very reasonable that that would happen. Because we're looking at how is this person receiving what I'm saying? Is there, you yeah. know, are they upset? Is there a micro expression that shows they're frustrated? And how can we disarm that if that occurs? Because that's going to happen. I'm going to say things that people are going to take a certain way. I'm going to trigger people. I might say something I regret. But if I can read the room, if I can read the energy, I have a much better chance of getting it back on track. Okay. So... I think I'm going to go in another direction because a lot of questions came in about this next statement. So let's just dive right into it because it's a little confusing and I can get it. They were like, huh? We have much more control of our lives than we might think. Okay, cool. That's part, first part of your statement. And 95% of what drives the way we act, react, think, and feel is our subconscious more autonomic mind. So I got a lot of, huh? Well, wait a minute. If I have more control than I think, but 95% I'm really not in control of, how do I have more control? And I right. do think that. Okay. So let's, let's start break it down. Let's break it down. Let's break it down. So let's go back to, which I'm glad I brought up because now this will be the second time we hear it. So this is good. The compass and the magnet. Okay. Okay. So when we move through the world, our conscious brain and a lot of folks who may not have heard about the subconscious as much, and a lot of people there are hearing more about it because with advancements in neuroscience, we're able to measure different parts of the brain and how we make decisions. Yet for most of us, when we first started learning about this, we're thinking, well, I'm conscious during the day. So aren't I operating consciously? And the answer to that is yes, however, the difference is 95% of our brain is looking at patterns. We're this incredible pattern matching machine, right? We're auditing it, what we see in the world against belief systems, prior experiences, and it's designed to work that way because it would be exhausting if we had to use critical thinking skills every single second. So we walk into a room, if we see something that looks familiar, or if we encounter a conversation that looks familiar, our brain immediately might go to, well, what happened last time? And then we act. We don't even know we do this. Or yeah. if you open an email from someone and let's say, you know, you know, this is a difficult individual or you have trouble getting along with them, you will read the email through that type of filter. So it happens so auto automatically, autonomic mind, we don't even realize it. And yet... It is controlling the outcomes we see. So are we in control of it? Yes. We just have to recognize where it's coming from, the magnet mind, and get in and make the change there. 
which is why you will see people repeat patterns in life. So the number one way to identify if you've got a subconscious mind, let's say script that is running or tape, is do you find yourself in the similar situations over and over again? We all know people that have dated the same person, just a different name, a different face. They've been in the same family argument. They're in the same problem with their job and their boss, yep. even though they've yep. changed jobs. So it's identifying those patterns and saying, okay, rather than this is happening to me, locus of control, I'm in control of what's going on and why this is occurring and what am I doing to bring it into my world and to create it. And there's a whole much we could cover on that, but that's how you can be in control, but it doesn't feel like it. Okay, so I just wanna make sure I'm getting this right for me and hopefully this will help others. If you think that you're aware of everything you're doing, absolutely not, right? You're just not. It, it, it just go, a lot of times it's like you said, unless you really make an effort, you're going through the motions, it's patterns you've created, you're reacting to things that happened before. But that being said, when you are aware of that, there's things that you can do to feed the subconscious. Yes. So, so are you um, are you aware of everything your subconscious is, but consciously our brains are not designed to be monitoring everything coming in. We automate what we repeatedly do. Just like if you think about the drive-in to work or if you drove yeah. to the store. Okay, so yeah. we know that. And, and we see that when we ride bikes, right? If we ride a bike and we've learned how to ride a bike, that's all happening subconsciously. We're not consciously thinking about it. It's just, it's happening. So yeah. we know in life that can occur. The difference becomes when you're aware you're having a reaction to something saying, you know what? This feels like a familiar situation. It's like an old friend. What gotcha. can I do to go in and have a different reaction? And then realizing the way human beings structure their reactions, there's usually a trigger. There's a belief system like, oh, I'm really upset at so-and-so because they talked to me this way. Okay, so what was similar about that? Well, growing up, I had an aunt or I had a parent you know, that did that. So it's amazing how many times we form associations based mm -hmm. on prior experience. So it's not really the situation at hand that's happening to us. It's we're carrying with us all of that prior stuff. That's why if you set a goal to be successful, to make more money, to have great relationships, mm -hmm. to be healthy, Consciously, you set this goal, but you keep finding yourself in the same result, right? There's something going on in the more powerful part of the brain that is disrupting the orientation of the compass. Mm -hmm. And that's when you got to get in and say, okay, what might be the belief system that I've got here that is creating the result? And that's what the work we do around locus of control yeah, is yeah. teaching people how to get more control. Okay. So I'm wondering... And I'm sure you'll know the answer to this. Why were we designed that way to have 95? That's like a large percentage. Right. Um, survival, right? So, so if you think about it, I mean, we have to be able to survive. And if you know, okay, I've got to go, you know, you got to remember where you're going. Your brain has to say, okay, look, the subconscious mind is there to develop habits and we learn certain associations. So when we're very young, like zero to five, zero to six, our brain is forming patterns and associations based on experiences. If we touch a burner, it's hot. We don't do that again, right? And it's locking away all these learnings. That's why you can learn a language so easily when you're younger because it downloads right in. So a lot of it is survival. It's like, well, okay, I want to move toward things that are good in life and away from things that are bad. And then a lot of it's the way our brain operates is that we can't consciously store all that information. It would be exhausting. Mm -hmm. So your brain will go, well, this is a habit the person keeps doing. So I'm just going to create an automatic neural pattern. And that's what neuroscience is able to measure. They can see in the brain automatic neural patterns. By the way, emotions, which is energy in motion, yeah, emotions yeah. are automatic patterns. So the kids that I teach, they want to understand why I was talking so much about mindset because they were talking, they wanted to make money, right? It was all about, they want to make money. Yes. So I brought in the old book. I don't even know it's here anymore. It's probably in the kitchen table called Think and Grow Rich. Yes. And I have my book. written in 1935. Napoleon Hill, yes. Right. But 
it was funny because the guy was saying the same exact thing. He was talking about it over and over again that you just mentioned. When yeah. people say, okay, I'm going to say these positive affirmations and they're like, oh, I'm going to make money, whatever. He was like, the brain puts together the emotion behind it, whether it's positive or negative. Right. It reacts to the emotion. So if you don't really believe it's true, you're going to get nowhere versus intensity and energy that that's the way we're wired. Yeah. Yes. So a couple of things about affirmations. It's funny you say that. I know we'll talk about this later, but one of the things we have is the Thrive Journal. And these are the six propulsion systems of the subconscious mind. The reason I say that is when you just mentioned about how, if we really don't believe it. Yeah. So we, we all kind of have this natural set point about money, right? It usually is a little bit more than we've had when we were growing up. But unless you've really broken out of some of the belief patterns, yep. it isn't much more. This is why you see people and they just seem to be stuck in the same cash flow problem, right? It's, it's a subconscious belief. So rather than fighting the conscious belief system, if you get in and make changes in the subconscious mind, which is where the belief is, right? Well, money is bad. I don't, I'm not worthy of this. I don't know what this looks like to have more money. I'm afraid I'll lose it. Will somebody be my friend? We have to get in and actually work with the belief system in the subconscious brain, which really mm -hmm. might just be, well, gosh, I don't know what it even looks like to have money. Or I didn't even think, you know, it takes courage to, to make an offer or to sell or to do this yeah. business deal. So that's why when he talked to people in, in Napoleon Hill, he did that study, right, of all those millionaires. They had a different way of thinking. They had a different way of operating and of belief systems. So you can change your belief system consciously. It just takes a lot of time. Or you can get in and work with the magnet mind where it's pretty automatic. And then pretty soon you just are like, wow, that's just very normal to me. Well, which one sounds better to you? I want to work with the magnet mind. Change is a lot easier because that's where the belief system lives that is creating the result. Mm -hmm. We don't think it is. We'll have a reason. Well, that person took advantage of me. My car broke down again. Yeah. Well, look at this. Yeah. I got scammed. Those are all excuses for the actual underlying reason which is a belief system. Okay, I'm thinking of it in a whole different way, Susie, and I like that. Let's get to, because it it's revolved around the same thing. You talk about lot, locus of control. And I was reading this statement, we can all develop this and strengthen our internal locus of control and take control of our lives and our leadership. So I looked it up. And I wasn't familiar as much as how you were referring to it as far as locus of control. And it says refers to a person's beliefs about how much control they have over what happens in their life. Is that true? Yeah. So notice what you just said. Belief, right? Where do beliefs live? Oh, God, here we go again. Know, right? Okay. So yeah. um, your, your real dominant beliefs, the ones that are controlling yeah. things, are in the yeah. subconscious brain. Yeah. So that's why I say, you know, it's to the degree to which you believe and perceive that the results you see in your life are the outcomes of your decisions, choices, and behaviors. And then you probably read versus an external locus yep, which yep. says chance, luck, and powerful others. Yep. So think of people that are always blaming the government. Oh, I would be so much richer if it weren't for the government, right? I can't believe they yeah. did this, right? Powerful others. Where I grew versus, up, my family, blah, blah, yep, blah. Yeah, exactly. So- Belief and what you just hit on, that's in the magnet mind. That can be changed. That's a decision. How do you convey that to people that have been in a really rough situation, you know, for generation after generation? Because, it's you know, it's if you've broken out a little bit, it's a lot easier. You know, but when you talk to people that they've seen their family and then the next generation, the next generation, how do you break through to them? I mean, how do you convince them? Well, I don't try to convince them. That's that's the good news. So I'm glad you mentioned that. So a couple couple things. One is and I got this statement from Peter Crone. Peter Crone does a lot of high performance sport athlete coaching, but he kind of would talk with folks and he'd say, who would you be if you didn't have that experience or that background? or that mm -hmm. belief system? Who could you be if you didn't have that? And so I think that disconnects the fact that we are more than our memories. We are more yeah. than our identity. 
and we are not what happened to us in the past. We're the way we are because of the way we think about what happened to us. It's a choice. Yeah. So what they're describing is simply an effect. It could be something that occurred in the past, but what it means to them is their decision of what they're going to make out of it. So if mm -hmm. they didn't have that experience, who could you be? Because the experience is not happening now. The other mechanism is we use the Thrive Journal. Timing, handwriting, repetition, imagination, visualization, and emotion. And that helps to override some of the belief systems that are so ingrained that it can take a long time and a lot of frustration. That's why a lot of folks that are in therapy, and I think therapy is wonderful, the right kind of therapy, but the ones that are always in the talking of the therapy, they don't mm. see the progress because they're not working with the most powerful part of the brain to get changed. They're just talking up here about all the reasons why they don't think they can get it, why it's somebody else's fault. But I'd ask, who would you be if you didn't have this? And are you more than your experience? Because it's all what it means to us. And we have evidence of this. People that have had traumatic brain injuries, amnesia, they have no memory of their early life, go on and lead much different lives. Ah, oh, that's awesome. I've never seen any of those studies. Oh, yeah. That's incredible. They don't even know what they don't know. And because in their mind, this didn't happen to them. It did, but it's the memory of it that we bring forward, that we encode. And there's so much research in my Locust book about memory and memory consolidation and reconsolidation. Mm. It's what it means to us and what we've decided to allow it to mean. And that's true in my own life. I just want to say, I'm not, I don't mean to sound like I'm just preaching, right? I'm not, yeah. but I looked in my life and I saw patterns I was repeating that were very destructive. And I realized I am not the way I am because of other people, prior experiences, family or childhood. It's what I had decided that meant to me. And then I chose to act a certain way in response. I can undecide that. I can make a different decision. And I did, I had to. I love, by the way, it was a good catch. I don't try to convince anybody of anything. That was awesome. Yeah. Now I used to do that. The lawyer, you know, I used to love that, but then you realize you're not really helping them see it. Like I, nobody could really have convinced me of this other yeah. than saying, Hey, you know, do you notice a pattern? You know, do, do you, you notice these things that keep happening? No. Do you think there's more to it than you, you know, and yeah, there generally is, but no, we don't try to convince. We just try to say, look, what what decision did you make because of that experience? And are you willing to make a different decision? And somebody might say no, and that's okay. You know, it's it's all like, what is it? No, I'm it? good. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd like to believe I'm a person that's not worthy of love and effect. You know, I mean, I'd like to like, just keep, okay. And there are people that they may actually say that because it's scary to think about the alternative. It's much, so the brain, here's one other thing about the brain. It prefers what's familiar over what's healthy. Meaning if we have been treated a certain way in our past, maybe we weren't worthy, somebody abused us, somebody talked down to us, somebody didn't value us, that's familiar. So the brain will go toward that rather than healthy because it doesn't understand healthy. That's considered unknown and unsafe. So that's a reason why you see folks sometimes in these horrible, abusive, toxic yeah. relationships because it's familiar. I did hear a guy say to me once, that's okay, Sandy. I'm good. It's the devil I know. That's exactly. Yeah. I, I love the candidness of it. Right. And that is true. It's it's the unknown is scary. And who would I, oh my gosh, what if I'm this, you know, and so I'd rather just stay in my misery. I know people it's this way. It's just, they're, they're negative, gossipy. That's just how they are because it's familiar and they'd rather be miserable, but feel stuck and familiar than be happy or have a chance at feeling happier and be a little bit out of their comfort zone. So it is a decision and I'm not making anybody wrong, but there is a better path out there, right? Yeah. And if you notice yourself constantly in the negative and the exhaustion and the overwhelm and the upsetness, the best thing I would tell you is you have an opportunity to shift that. It's a decision. It's a neural pathway. It's a, it's a pattern. It's a belief system. You know, though, I'm thinking about some people that say they want to change, but you know how you can meet some people and you're like, Ooh, they're just so not right. They're not there yet. And they're living in yeah. victim mode for lack of a better, 
uh, there's got to be a better word out there than victim mode, but you know what I mean. And well, they're living in the matrix. It's kind of like the movie, The Matrix, right? They're they're sort of in this world that they believe is real, but they're not yeah. really fulfilled, right? Yeah. Yeah. But by the way you provide information or different people come into the lives at different times, it's always better if they come to their own conclusion, like you said, versus like you have to do it this way or you won't succeed. They need to find it out for themselves, but mm -hmm. you were there at the right time to provide the information when they were ready. Yep. Yeah. Or, or they realize this isn't getting better. I yeah. keep repeating this pattern. I've tried everything and it's not working because they're working with the wrong part of the brain. Or I don't say the wrong part, the weaker part of the brain. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah, like you said, yeah, I've had enough. I can't do this anymore. There's got to be a better way. Yeah. And then you you seek answers. And you have to have be willing to say, I am more than my behavior. And even if I was doing this my whole life, if I know there's a better way, I'm willing to change anything. Like I said that once, I was like, I'm willing to change anything about myself to get a better result because I am more than my behaviors, right? Like my identity, I'm a person of faith. I believe is that is that part of God in me is like, I'm more than my behaviors, my personality, all of that. Any of that can change. I don't lose my identity. I like that. I, I was, was it, I think it may have been Dr. Joe Dispenza. Do you know who he is? Yes, I have his book, uh, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. That's very- Yes, funny. I was yes. thinking that. He was like, Love yeah, you're just going to have to change. <laughs> you know, people, and he was joking because there was like that song, like, don't go change in, blah, blah, blah. He goes, no, no, you're going to have to change. <laughs> yeah. It's not well, I mean, it's like, you know, I, and this is a very simplistic, I've heard some people say it this way, and I think it's true enough to be true. You know, you buy an iPhone, right, or an iPad, and if you never upgrade it, if you just leave it as is, what do you think is going to happen to the programs on there or the apps? It's kind of like our brains, our belief systems. If we never change and grow and think and think again, as Adam Grant says, and rethink and self-reflect, what do you think is going to happen to our brains? We're going to be like the Apple iPhone or the iPod, which has corrupted programs. So, you know, we, mm. we as human beings, even our cells are changing on a cellular level. If we can embrace the fact that even though we might have thought a certain way for 10, 20, 30 years, if we're not getting where we want to go, if it's not working, if we're stuck in the same poverty, toxic relationship, you know, negative worldview, poor health outcomes, might there be a better way? And just asking Perhaps I have more control and I just haven't found the way yet. And that's why we work with the subconscious, because even in leadership, most of the time leaders hit walls, not because of their intelligence or because of their abilities, it's their belief systems. Susie, I could talk to you forever, but we, we got to go here, man. We're running out of time. But I do want to touch on, before we go, a few of your books. Sure. And... The, I know then you'll tell us where we can find them. So let's start with, do you have their locus take control and change the direction of your life? Cause you, I do. Yeah. And you see the compass and the magnet. So we go through very short book. This is not a long book, the neuroscience, but it's for like business people. It's for non-neuroscientists. Why does the brain work this way? We talk today, very generic, very broad yeah. level, yeah. right? Yeah. This will, this will show you studies to back all this up because at the end of the day, I'm a researcher, or, you know, I, I need to see the, the science and I need to see the research to go, okay, I know why this works. So they don't have to just take a leap of faith, right, Susie? No, nope. you got a 160 page book you can read and reference and say, aha, I see why this is important. All right, you held it up before, the Thrive Journal, a step-by-step -step guide to help you create and accomplish your goals. Smaller. Yes, even smaller. So this, as you can tell by the color coding, this is um, part of the, it's in Locus too, but this is the actual journal. So if you say, Susie, I totally get it. I understand Locus of Control. How do I get change? Follow this. We did a focus group, 17 people, three weeks. We saw a statistically significant change. This is a program of the subconscious mind. It will help you download into your brain what you want, not what you're necessarily getting. So this is a really good tool for that. And you do it. Here's a little secret. You do it before you go to sleep. 
Not when you get up in the morning, because before you go to sleep, whatever you put in your brain, think about dreams, think about things you scroll on social media and you see it drops right in. So we use a yep. natural magic timing portal to reprogram the subconscious mind. Cool. What about chief energy officer? Chief energy officer, the new CEO. So then this one, this is so great because it kind of comes full circle to the question about your leadership energy. Once you kind of have read these and you understand the premise of locus of control, this tells you how to leverage it in leadership. So you'll read this and go, okay, I understand now on a subconscious energetic level why the most important thing I can bring into the room is my energy. And that's really what a CEO should be doing. Did I miss any? No, <laughs> that's the only ones. And I'm working on a new one called Quantum Lead. Well, oh, actually, I knew it. There was in black, yeah. Quantum Lead. So um, I do have a journal I made for our Walsh College students, obviously, yeah. but that's on Amazon, but that's not the books. That's just a different journal. But Quantum Lead takes a look at quantum entanglement, quantum physics, and a lot of the emerging science and how that factors into leadership and vision. That should be out later this year. Besides that, you got nothing going on. <laughs> Not at all. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love this, Sandy. I really appreciate this opportunity because this lights me up. These are, you know, I wish somebody had come to me 30 years ago now, maybe 20, who knows, and said, read this. This will explain a lot of what will be happening and how to get out of it. And instead, I spent nine years in therapy, great people, great therapists. And I remember one point, you know, therapist like agenda. And I'm like, what do you mean agenda? solve this. Like I've come to you now, how many years, the same problem, I'm paying you to solve it. Instead, I got to go solve it, which is fine because I looked up all that. I said, okay, something's going on. And I'm like, how did it get in? And then once I figured out how did it get in this way, we work on how do I change it to get where I want to go? Because it's not enough just to say, I don't want to be this. I don't want to be that. What do you want instead? And how can you get it? And who would you be if you didn't have all that extra stuff? Mm -hmm. Mm. I don't know. We should leave on that note, but I have to ask you, is there anything we didn't get in that you want to tell the lady? No, other than, you know, if you're, if you're listening to this and you're thinking this was a lot, uh, I don't know about that. It's okay. Like I, I know that we pushed some people, we stretched some, but I would say this, if you're interested to learn more, get the books, but also I would be so happy to reach out and just connect with you and talk because when people did this for me, it really changed, right? The, the folks that I interviewed, the, the things I yeah. learned. So Sandy, definitely share. The best way to find me is LinkedIn. I don't have a lot of other social media. I'm on LinkedIn, okay. so legal. but I'd like you to know, like we're in this together. There's definitely, you know, tools and mm -hmm. resources out there. And once you master changing the subconscious mind, doesn't mean things are perfect, but you'll be amazed at how quickly you rebound and how things change very quickly and very significantly. So that is the good news to leave everybody with. Yay, good news. All right, my, hey, I got something to say, ladies. Few things. Number one, if you only heard part of this or listened to part of this or didn't watch it all, don't worry. When we're done, it's going to be recorded and then by this evening, we'll be posted on all the sites. So watch it wherever you want. My website, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, LinkedIn, YouTube, it's everywhere. Also, in another mm, four or five weeks, we also have a Let's Keep It Real episode that will be coming out. So if you even want to have more, you'll be able to dive into that. And that's a whole different type of interview. Besides that, you know how grateful I am for you. I love that you guys are out there making such a difference. You're such good, kind people and you're spreading joy everywhere. And I am grateful for you. And until next time, you know what I'm going to say. Thank you, Susie and toodles. Bye, Sandy. Bye, everyone.